So, ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a super treat, okay? Tonight, it is my great pleasure. You might have had a chance to meet Rabbi Salkin last night. He was our darshan at services, our um, guest speaker at services. If you didn't have a chance to hear him, I highly recommend that you take some time and look at the YouTube video of last night's service. Rabbi Salkin was amazing, and Simon Barrett, our cantoral soloist, was amazing, and Jonathan was amazing. So come and listen to what all of these people contributed in our beautiful sanctuary. Um, and you may have had a chance to study some Torah with Rabbi Salkin this morning. A Torah study tonight, we have the great privilege of bringing in Slichot and the very beginning of our high holiday season immediately following this lecture. Please join us upstairs for a short and beautiful, beautiful moment in the sanctuary to hear some music. Jonathan and Simon will meet us upstairs and the very short service, contemplative service, concludes with the changing of the Torah mantles to white which means that we are really entering into the high holiday season. We'll have a chance to hear the show from well in a beautiful zone, and we'll be ready, or at least you will be, for our rush team. <laughs> I'm not guaranteeing that I'll be ready after tonight, but I'm getting closer and closer. Rabbi Jeffrey Salkin is an amazing thinker, orator, leader of the Jewish community in the United States. He is lauded as one of the really incredible rabbis of our day who is looking at the Jewish people, the Jewish future, and helping us to understand trends and possibilities and directions that we're going in. Rabbi Salkin has a column and a podcast called Martini Judaism for those who like to be shaken and stirred. <laughs> uh, he has written 11 books. His 12th book is coming out this January. I was just learning about the contents of this book. It sounds amazing. He's written three Torah commentaries. He has written for magazines, newspapers around the country, spoken on all kinds of podcasts and TV shows and places. So um, his, his resume is quite extensive, but I will say the most important I don't know if I can use the word important, but to me, the most important thing on his resume is that he was my rabbinic mentor at the Community Synagogue in Port Washington, where I had the extraordinary, extraordinary privilege to intern, as I said last night, beginning on September 11, 2001. And so it was, we were just talking at dinner, I remember after the second plane hit, I was in Manhattan and I called Rabbi Salkin, fourth year rabbinical student, and I didn't want to not show up on the first day of my internship. It seemed a bad idea. So I called Rabbi Salkin and I said, no, there's some like disruption. <laughs> um, it was early in the morning and we had no idea what a horrible, horrible day it would turn out to be. Um, and Rabbi Salkin said, yeah, I don't know, the trains might run a little late or whatever. It's going to be a little difficult today. So why don't you just come on Thursday? And of course, by Thursday, the world had changed radically, and Manhattan was silent, and I'll never, ever, ever forget the cloud of sort of burning hair and smoke that lingered over Manhattan. And Rabbi Salkin talked extensively about next steps in our lives as Jewish people from the Bima, um, at Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and the Shabbat immediately following, because I think Rosh Hashanah, if I'm not mistaken, was September 16th, something like that. It was immediately following. So I came right into this extraordinary internship. It was sort of what you might call in some other religious institution a baptism by fire. Yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of showed up and all of a sudden I learned everything that I hadn't learned from Marty Wiener from Jeff <laughs> So um, I really am, I feel so blessed to have been taught by the very, very, very best of the best. And it's a great privilege to be able to introduce Rabbi Jeff Salkin to teach us tonight why Jews don't cancel. Thank you, Rabbi Kraft. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be with this holy community on such a sacred time, on such a sacred evening, as we prepare for the days of awe. And I want to offer you some thoughts this evening gratitude to, to all of you for being here on what I believe to be the essential political problems that we are dealing with in America and in the Jewish people. And I want to start by saying this. 
the story in the Torah that defines me politically is a story about how in the book of Exodus the Israelites are crossing the parted waters of the Sea of Reeds or the Red Sea and the text says the waters were split and the Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. <laughs> now I will share with you the following. I have for many years defined myself and I have been defined by others as a centrist. Sometimes, depending on what is going on in the world, I am nudged out of my centrism towards the left. I confess to you that is what has happened to me in America and in Israel recently. Sometimes, depending on my fears and other things, I am nudged out of my centrism and I move to the right. I believe that's healthy. But I want to share with you the following perception. Number one, those walls that exist on the left and on the right are walls that I keep on bumping into in my own life. Secondly, a friend of mine said to me recently, the problem with being in the middle of the road is that you can be hit by cars going in either direction. <laughs> and I accept that as being a core intellectual and ethical and existential challenge of being someone in the middle. I also believe that the danger of being a centrist is that you can be paralyzed intellectually into doing nothing. And that is a fearful place to be. Now, how did I get into this predicament of the spirit? It's because God, in her infinite wisdom, has blessed me with a sacred ability to see things from many different angles. God has offered me the ability to hear a multitude of stories and narratives. God has allowed me to try to find the good and the true in all of those stories and to see nuances. I come by this honestly. My father, Allah Shalom, was a professional photographer. My father disdained color photography. He preferred to work in black and white. It was not because he believed that the world was black and white, he did on some issues, but because he believed that real photographic artistry resides in the gray areas and the shadows, and he would often remind me that great photographers like Alfred Eisenstadt, Diane Arbus, and Walker Evans all preferred to work in black and white. The other thing that has shaken me to the core is this thing called cancel culture, which we will discuss this evening. Now, critics may deride the term, and some will even deny its very existence. Cancel culture is an intellectual movement that tries to silence people with whom you disagree. I live in the state of Florida, in a state of great confusion. <laughs> we are living in Florida through the cancel culture of the right, which exists in the form of intellectual and literary boycott, as in banning books. I'm embarrassed to say and it was reported in the Jewish press this week that even our local JCC, uninvited an author who had written a book about slavery. 
When I complained about this to the Federation exec, he said, no, it was all misunderstanding. And a lower level employee basically spoke out of ignorance and we issued an apology and we re-invited her. On the left, cancel culture exists in the form of the soft censorship of views, loss of relationships, loss of professional opportunities, and outright insults. I believe that both of these are dangerous. As Brett Stevens has written on the issue, cancellation is like being erased. Someone who's canceled will lose not only her job, but her career. Not only her career, but her reputation. Not only her reputation, but her friends. Not only her friends, but in some cases, her will to live. What happens, my friends, is that this freezes out our ability to engage with people we disagree with, which means that we lose our ability to engage with ourselves. In 2020, 60% of Americans admitted that they have views that they are afraid to share in public, and another 32% fear that their job prospects could be harmed by speaking their mind. And it is devastating. And it is devastating because, my friends, this is a threat to liberal democracy. It represents the intrusion, coming from the left, of political ideology into workplaces that were once mostly free from it. Now, I want to speak to you about cancel culture and why Jews don't cancel. And in the text sheets that you have, I want to outline for you, and by the way, in your honor, Rabbi, I've decided to teach something this evening that I've never taught before. This is all new material. So if it is terrible, please, I accept total blame. I believe profoundly in the following truth. And as we enter the days of law, I invite you to believe this as well. The Jewish people were not put on this earth merely to create great comedians, <laughs> questionable cuisine, <laughs> and Nobel Prize winners. I will confess to you that whenever people list on Facebook all the great Nobel Prize winners, I respond by saying, ho, hum. This is not why God chose us inside. We were not chosen to be a smart man. We were chosen to be a wise people. <clears throat> and it is the goal of the Jewish people, listen carefully, to enter the marketplace of American ideas and to say that we have ideas that can compete intellectually in the realm of American life and that those ideas, listen to me now, will save America. If that seems grandiose to you, overly ambitious to you, and even pretentious to you, then let those be the final sins that I've committed this year. <laughs> Actually, when is Rosh Hashanah? Next Friday night? I've got an entire week to make up for a year of essentially living in purity. Now, what do I mean by this? The Jews, through Judaism, have a way of reshaping the American conversation on politics and culture that will wind up being redemptive in the life of America. Let me say that again. We Jews have a way of teaching and reshaping the idea of what it means to engage in the culture that can redeem America. Now I refer to these as the seas. We're going to cross the seas together. 
First, we need to develop and to celebrate a culture of curiosity. Now, what does that mean? It means when we encounter people with whom we vociferously disagree, it means inculcating within our minds and within our souls a habit of mind in which we ask our protagonist, how did you arrive at your position? <coughs> Now that culture of curiosity might actually mean the following. You know, I can empathize with what you're going through and where you're coming from on these points. I think you are misreading these points. I actually think your position would be stronger if you considered these points. Do you see what that's like? How did you get to where you are? And walk me through that. Now let me give you a big footnote. Lest you think that I'm in favor of kumbaya. Kumbaya, by the way, is a Hebrew word. Kum, let it arise, baya, problem. Kumbaya, the problem arises. <laughs> For many years, I used to teach our high school students the following wisdom. Your mind should never be so open that everything falls out. <laughs> you are allowed and permitted to have strongly held opinions, and you are allowed to have your truth. Nowhere is it written that you have an obligation to bend over backwards to accept the narrative of someone who is so radically unlike you that you find their positions to be absolutely immoral. For me, on the right, that would mean people who believe that the election was stolen. This is just wrong. <coughs> On the left, this would mean, I'm speaking Jewishly now, and I know I'm maybe putting on be that I have no real interest in hanging out with people who do not believe there should be a state of Israel. If you think that there should be a better Israel, we'll talk about tomorrow, that tomorrow, that's great. If you are still upset about what happened in 1967, we can talk about that. But if you're upset about what happened in 1948, I have nothing to say to you. I do not believe that it is a mitzvah for me to speak to anti-Semites of any stripe. I also don't believe that it's a mitzvah for me to hang out with bigots of any stripe. If you say to me, I think that public policy is wrong in these areas, and I think that actually we might not be helping poor people and minority people as effectively as we think we are. We have something to talk about. Do you understand? Of course you do. Number two, we need a culture of controversy in which we accept the kashrut of different opinions. Any disagreement, a machloket, that is for the sake of heaven, l'shem shamayim, will continue to exist. But one that is not for the sake of heaven will not continue to exist. In other words, if you are arguing about something and there's a sacred purpose here, if God is present in this conversation, that's cool. We can talk. Now, what is a disagreement that is for the sake of heaven? That is a disagreement of Hillel and Shammai. There are two 
different schools of opinion in the early rabbinic period, and they disagreed on a lot of things. In general, the halakha, Jewish law, is according to Hillel, with one or two crazy exceptions. By the way, I am raising money for a new Jewish students organization. I'm tired of Hillel. I'm starting an organization called Shema. <laughs> <laughs> it's for grumpy Jews. <laughs> but one that is not for the sake of heaven, this would be the disagreement of Korach and his group in the book of Numbers. And why was that not a godly controversy? Because Korach's ego was in this. This was a power play. What we learn from this is the following. If we're talking about ideas, we can talk about ideas. But if we're simply talking about who owns the power, that's trick. The second text <clears throat> is the most quoted text during my summers at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. So much so that it's become a bit of a joke. This is one of the great cliche texts of rabbinic Judaism, as well as being one of the most important. And this text was particularly beloved by the founder of the Shalom Hartman Institute, Rabbi David Hartman, Zichron del who was my teacher and my role model. This is the story of the oven of Achnai. This is about sages trying to figure out whether a certain oven would be kosher or not. Now, I'll spare you the details, because you're just going to go into coma. <laughs> it's about whether an oven that is comprised of making of these little tiles, whether that's kosher or not, doesn't matter. I'm not making light of it. I'm just telling you, we're going to cut to the chase. On that day, Rabbi Eliezer brought forth every imaginable argument, but the sages did not accept any of them. Finally, he said to them, if the halakha agrees with me, let this carob tree prove it. The carob tree was uprooted and replanted 100 cubits away from its place. Just No proof can be brought from a carob tree, they retorted. By the way, they were all doing gummies at this time. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to understand. The early sages, they were total stoners, and only people who were totally stoned are going to make up this stuff. Again, he said to them, if the halakha agrees with me, let the channel of water prove it. Sure enough, the channel of water flowed backward. No proof can be brought from a channel of water, they rejoined. Again, he urged, if the halakha agrees with me, let the walls of the house of study prove it. The walls tilted as if to fall. But Rabbi Joshua rebuked the walls, saying, when disciples of the wise are engaged in a halakhic dispute, what right have you to interfere? It is, it is, it is, it is, we're out of the realm of gummies, we're now into acid. <laughs> okay? Hence, in deference to Rabbi Joshua, they did not fall, and in deference to Rabbi Eliezer, they did not resume their upright position. They're still standing at a slant. We are farmers. <laughs> Again, Rabbi Eliezer said to the sages, if the halakha agrees with me, let it be proven from heaven. What's happened is that he brings all these magical interventions. I want to be right. And all these things happen, and the sages say, big deal. <laughs> We're not buying it. A divine voice cried out, why do you dispute Rabbi Eliezer, with whom the halakha always agrees? But Rabbi Joshua stood up and protested, quoting this week's Torah portion. <laughs> The Torah is not in heaven. Lo b'ashamayim. We pay no attention to a divine voice. In other words, even if God were to tell us what the truth is, we're not believing it. Rabbi Nathan met the prophet Elijah and asked him, what did the Holy One do in that moment? God laughed with joy, saying, my children have defeated me. My children have defeated me. Now, we could spend a week discussing this text alone. But what it means is simply this, and what Rabbi Hartman taught brilliantly in his book, A Living Covenant. 
is that God rejoices in the disputes of sages who abrogate for themselves the authority to override the divine word itself. As Yehuda Kurtzer, who is now the co-president of the Hartman Institute, along with Rabbi Daniel Hartman, Rabbi Hartman's son, he said, you know, when we talk about prophetic Judaism, which, by the way, is classical form Judaism, is a big conceit, we are prophetic Jews. The problem with prophetic Judaism is it roots itself in Ko Amar Adonai, this is what God says. You don't mess with the prophets. Frederick Buechner, a blessed memory, a great Episcopal writer, once quipped, there is no evidence of a prophet ever being invited back a second time for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> there were royal pains in the ass. I mean, really, you want Jeremiah at your dinner table? I don't think so. Ezekiel, he'd be fun. He'd be fun. Rabbi, what Yehuda Kurtzer says is, the prophetic model is, this is what God says. But the rabbinic model is, this is what we say. And we argue with each other. You tell me, which is a healthier model to have. You see, the prophetic model of American religion, part of which I actually agree with, I mean, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, you know, heirs of the prophet, I, 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 I get it. But the problem is that it takes no prisoners. It's not only that it's my way or the highway, it's God's way or the highway. What would happen if we encouraged in America the notion of conversation? Elu ve elu divrei Elohim chayim, both these and these are the words of the living God. Now, lest you think that this means relativism, that anything goes, the rabbis say, but the halakha is according to Hillel. In other words, you, we can talk about this all you want to, but at the end of the day, this is what we do. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is a very redemptive model. But who determines that? It's determined by the way the tradition has played itself out. Now, I, by the way, I personally believe discussing this with Rabbi Graf over dinner, that in my new book, uh, Tikkun Ha'am, Repairing Our People, Imagining a Future for Liberal Judaism in America, it's science fiction. Um, <laughs> I would argue that there are several possible models for the continuation of reformed Jewish ideology in America that haven't been tried yet. Number one, that of Franz Rosenzweig, the great German Jewish theologian, who basically said, we do what we can, not what we want to. <clears throat> By the way, and I would expand can to what we can intellectually accept. The second model is, is obscure, but you'll love it. It's the model of the Mizrahim, of the Jews of Arab lands and of Persia, who are much less obsessed with what you're not supposed to do as with what you should do. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, I was with my late father-in-law, my first father-in-law, uh, before he died. Obviously. <laughs> this is an interesting story. We went out to lunch. I confess my sins today. It was a Shabbat afternoon in Great Neck, New York, where he lived, which has an extremely large Iranian Jewish population, as does, as you know, Beverly Hill. Yes. Beverly Hills, they call it Tarantulas. So we go to a restaurant, which is a Treif restaurant. Not that, eating, not that I'm eating Treif, but it's not a kosher restaurant. It's Shabbat. 
and we're sitting there, and there are a group of men wearing black silk kippots at the next table, eating and having a good time. And they're speaking Farsi. So I, being you know a smart ass, I over them and said, "Hey, Shabbat Shalom, nice to meet you." Hey, Shabbat. He said, "Look, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be judgmental, but it is Shabbat, and this is a trade restaurant, and I'm assuming that you spent money to eat here." And they said, oh, well, glad you asked that. We just came from one of the Persian synagogues here at Great Neck. Services are over. And we're having lunch together as our continuation of Shabbat. Isn't it great? <laughs> <laughs> and what I loved about that was that they were focusing on the positive mitzvah of enjoying Shabbat and not on the stuff you're not supposed to do. Because among many Sephardim and Mizrahim, there is this suspicion that Halakha is the invention of a bunch of grumpy white guys in Poland. <laughs> okay? So who determines? History determines. Uh, in the Midrash on Psalms, Rabbi Abahu says that Rabbi Akiva had a distinguished disciple, and Rabbi Meir was his name. And he would prove the purity of a reptile from the Bible with 49 reasons, and he would prove its impurity with 49 reasons. Then you can read the rest of the passage on your own. But basically what it's saying is that in order to be a sage in ancient times, you had to be able to say that a reptile, you had to prove that it was impure, and you had to be able to prove that it was pure. It was an intellectual game just to show not that there's no truth, but that you can understand things in many different ways. We need a culture of compromise. Hey, I'm going to teach you a little bit about the placement of the, the mezuzah on the door. Those of you who have properly affixed the mezuzot to your doorposts, I hope that's everyone here, because if you have it on the wrong way, all sorts of stuff's going to happen. I've got to tell you. I'm going to tell you how it's supposed to be, and if it's not that way, you better just go home tonight. You better pry this, this, this thing off and just put it back on, because in the Talmud it says that those who fail to affix their mezuzot properly will suffer the loss of Wi-Fi. <laughs> And that's what happened to me this morning when I was teaching. <laughs> you see, Rashi, who was the great sage, the authority of medieval Rhineland, founder really of Ashkenazi Jewry, he believed that the mezuzah should be vertical. His grandson, Rabbeinu Tam, thought it should be horizontal. <laughs> and a compromise was needed, <laughs> and that's why it's diagonal. And also because it points inward to the house. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. My friend and colleague, Rabbi Elise Frischman, tells the following story about the Hebrew word for truth, which is emet. This is so cool. <laughs> If you write out the Hebrew Alephate from right to left, which by the way is the only way to do it, if you do it the other way, but okay, weird things are gonna happen to you. Also. <laughs> I'm just here to tell you that if you are, if your mezuzah, if your mezuzah are not in the right position, you're screwed. If you try to write out the Hebrew alphabet from left to right rather than right to left, just you're going to have grandkids who eat Play-Doh. <laughs> it it's going to happen. I'm just telling you that. Okay. So if you write out the Hebrew Aleph bait from right to left, starting with Aleph to top, what's the letter that's the furthest letter on the right? Aleph. What's the letter that's furthest on the left? What's the letter that's in the middle? Mem. Mem. Truth, therefore, is the right, the left, and the middle. All in conversation 
with each other. Now, again, let me remind you that I'm not a relativist and I'm not going to hang out with everybody. There are positions on the extreme right that I find to be absolutely traitor. I don't want to have anything to do with those people. There are positions on the extreme left that I don't want to, I don't want to deal with either. You know, the thing about, for example, how many of you saw Oppenheimer? Not yet. Okay, all right, I won't give away anything. I'm not, okay, listen to it. Okay, I'm just gonna basically, spoiler alert. Yeah. He invented the atom bomb. <laughs> the second thing is, a lot of people died. Okay, now you can see it. I'm actually working on a mashup of Barbie and Goldberg. <laughs> which will be actually very cool. The thing about Oppenheimer was that he was a communist. Okay? A great, uh, a great literary figure said the following. Here's what you need to know about the communists. The mind must maintain two truths that are contradictory at the same time. McCarthy was evil. So were the communists. That's not contradictory. What's that? It's not contradictory. Well, it's not. But, but it's, it's hard for one mind to take over. I mean, you know, Stalin was not a bargain. Let me just tell you something, okay? I still resent that there are people of a certain generation who, who maintained their loyalty to Stalin for their entire lives, including a man whose music I otherwise greatly admire, Pete Seeger. <laughs> Stalinist to the very end. Even after the, even after the horrors were revealed. So we, politically, we have to be able to understand these things. Now, I'm going to jump uh, the text from the text of of of, of Ralph Cook because it's too beautiful to even teach you this evening. But you'll have this; you can hang out with. You. We need a culture of compassion. And there's a story in the Talmud about Rabbi Yochanan, who had an intellectual sparring partner named Reish Lakish. And Ra Reish Lakish died. By the way, Reish Lakish was like one of the bad boys of the Talmud. He was like, he was like a, a hood. But he came to Torah, and he was a great teacher, and he died. And Yochanan was disconsolate uh, with the loss of his friend. And the sages sought to console him by bringing him a new friend, Rabbi Elazar ben Padat. So they bring Elazar, and they seat him before him. And for every issue that Yochanan mentioned, Elazar said, there's a teaching that supports you. Yeah. Yochanan said to him, do I need this? When I made a statement, Reish Lakish would object with 24 objections, and I would solve them with 24 solutions. And thus our traditions expanded. This isn't that beautiful? Our understanding of the traditions expanded. But you say there's a teaching that supports you. Don't I know I speak well? Don't I know that? What do I need this for? He tore his clothes and went crying at the gates. Where are you, son of Lakish? Where are you, son of Lakish? Until he lost his mind. Sages prayed for him and he died. He was so upset at the loss of his friend that he died of grief. But more than that, they brought him a new friend. And what was deficient in that new friend? He agreed with him. He couldn't be the intellectual sparring partner that was necessary. Now, I want to go to, in, in terms of this culture of compassion, as we sail towards the exciting conclusion of our time together, because I do want to make room for questions, I want to bring you to the story of Gershom Sholem and Hannah Arendt. And this is an amazing story because actually its exciting conclusion took place exactly 60 years ago this week. Now, Gershom Sholem, how many of you know the name? Okay. The great scholar of Jewish mysticism. Probably the greatest scholar of Judaism that the 20th century produced. 
amazing thing about Gershom Scholl, he came from a very assimilated German Jewish family. His father was such a disconnected Jew that his mother, this is a great story, this is like totally German Jewish. Mother would light Shabbos candles, and the father would light a cigar off the candles. <laughs> and he would say, Baruch Tadunai Borei Pre Tobacco. <laughs> Which is. You gotta love him. Right? In other words, he knew enough to be a jerk. <laughs> now, Gershom Sholom, born Gerhard Sholom, he had a brother who was a communist, that was Werner. Gerhard, who becomes Gershom, he, as a teenager, falls in love with Zionism. So what do his parents do? They get him a gift of a portrait of Herzl. That's the good news. The bad news? It was for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and his interlocutor was the political philosopher Hannah Arendt. Now, by the way, there's a movie about their friendship, which you can find on Netflix. And it's actually a pretty good movie. Now, Gershom and Hannah, she was a problematic person. First of all, she maintained a, a there's no nice way of saying this. She had an affair with the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, who was a Nazi. Well, Gershom and Hannah had this correspondence went on for decades. It was like a real correspondence. This wasn't text messages, it wasn't emails. They actually, you know, wrote it out in pen and with typewriters, okay? And it reached its climax exactly 60 years ago, 1963. Now, let me tell you what happened. This is an important part of, of modern Jewish history, and this might be a review for some of you. And this falls into the realm of gossip, but you're going to love it. <laughs> New York, the New Yorker, editor of the New Yorker, William Sean, whose son was the comedian Wallace Sean. <laughs> William Sean sends Hannah Arendt to Jerusalem to do what? To cover the trial of Adolf Eichmann. Now, for those of you who were not born at that time, you know who you are, and some of you were around then, let me just basically locate this moment in time that was when the enormity of the Shoah, before it was called the Shoah, it was, it was barely called the Holocaust at that point, that they really didn't have a word for it, was first being reported. And that's when the survivors took the stand, and that's when the Jewish world finally began to understand what had happened. Now, I could tell you a brief cultural history of the Holocaust, in American popular culture. Number one, Gentlemen's Agreement, 1947, which came out two years after the oven stopped. There was not a single reference to the Holocaust in that movie about anti-Semitism. Number two, The Diary of Anne Frank, The Diary of a Young Girl. I need an hour to unpack for you exactly what went down there, especially because The Diary of Anne Frank the graphic novel version was censored in my home state of Florida. And I'll tell you why it was censored. It was censored because Otto Frank, when he got back to the annex, he finds the diary and he reads it and he's moved and scandalized. There's stuff that we think Anne Frank said that she never said. I still believe that people are good in jail. She might have said that in the annex. She wouldn't have said that in Bergen Belsen. And no one wants to know how she died. The American public could not handle that. You just don't want to know. He 
reads the diary, and what does he pull out? He censors all the stuff about her arguments with her mother, because as you know, teenage girls never argue with their mothers. <laughs> Number two, about her bur burgeoning sexuality and her, her sexual feelings about Peter. Okay, they were getting it on in, in the annex, I'm pretty sure. I, I don't think it's wrong to say that. So she, she had lesbian fantasies that she wrote about. And those were reinstated in later editions of the diary and in the graphic novel version, and that's why Governor DeSantis had to pull this thing. And then there was an episode of the Twilight Zone in the late 1950s in which a, a German commandant is sent back to a concentration camp and he's tormented by the prisoners. There's only one word that wasn't used in that episode. Jews. So New, New, the New Yorker sends Hannah Arendt to Jerusalem to cover the Eichmann trial. And she goes to the trial, and that becomes a series of articles, which becomes her most famous book, Eichmann in Jerusalem. The book was problematic for several reasons. You need to know this. Number one, how did she portray Eichmann? As a soulless bureaucrat. Okay? Boring. Okay? As a mediocre person. Number two, she had harsh things to say about the Jews who served on the Judenrat, the Jewish councils in the ghettos, in Warsaw, in Vilna, in Lodz, in so many ghettos. The Nazis forced the members of the Judenrat to obey their orders, to make up the list of people who would be deported, to collaborate the deaths of their fellow Jews, and then they themselves went to their deaths. This, by the way, is why I have no tolerance at all for the stuff about George Soros. Now, to be sure, George Soros and I don't agree politically. That's not the point. The point is that this whole libel that he was a Nazi collaborator, and that what did he do? He went around and he collected the belongings of, of Jews, and he, he was 14 years old. And when people give me that crap, I say to them the following. I invite you to say the same. Have you ever been tested in this way? Do you know what you would have done? And I go one step further. Do you really want to know how every survivor survived? You don't want to know. A little bit of humility in the face of the devil would be appropriate. So she was very judgmental towards those Jews. And those depictions infuriated Sholem. And this was one of the most famous correspondences in Jewish history. And he writes the following. It is the heartless, the downright malicious tone you employ in dealing with a topic that so proud, profoundly concerns the center of our life. There is something in the Jewish language that is completely indefinable, yet fully concrete. What the Jews call Ahavat Yisrael, or love for the Jewish people, with you, my dear Hannah, there is no trace of it. He comes very close to calling her a self hating Jew. Now, how does she hit back? The magnificence of this people once lay in its belief in God, and now this people believes only in itself. In this sense, I don't love the Jews, nor do I believe in them. I belong to this people in nature and in fact. Now, philosophically speaking, she had a really good move here. And let me just basically tell you, what she was saying to Shalom was this. Number one, it's not my job to love the Jews. Number two, it's God's job to love the Jews. 
Number three, you're going to love this. How can I love a huge faceless entity that cannot possibly love me back? That's not a bad philosophical move. I get it. So I will tell you this, that I have ended friendships for far less. On September 14th, 1963, understand, this is now the 60th anniversary of this letter. Hunter writes back to Scholl, and she accuses him of misunderstanding her work, her ideas, her passions, her life. It was a, a very harsh letter. And how does she choose to end the letter? With best wishes for your trip to Europe. <laughs> no snark intended. She was basically saying, I disagree with everything you've written. You, un you misunderstand me. You malign me. You rip me to shreds. You insult me. But have a good trip to Europe. The friendship survived. Now I end with the following poem that I've always loved by the late lamented, I would even say iconic Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai, who is so beloved in Israel that there's a neighborhood in, in Jerusalem where he used to live and there's a plaque that says this is where Yehuda Amichai lived. From the place where we are right, listen to this poem. From the place where we are right, flowers will never grow in the spring. The place where we are right is hard and trampled like a yard. But doubts and loves dig up the world like a mole, a plow. And a whisper will be heard in the place where the ruined house once stood. The place where we are right will never yield flowers. It is a place that is sterile. And what is the ruined house? Abayat HaNechrav. It is, I believe, a reference to the ancient temple, the Temple Mount. The place where the whisper will be heard. The whisper of God. Why don't Jews cancel? because of those seeds. And to review, we need a culture of curiosity. We need a culture of controversy. And we need a culture of compassion. We need to be able to hear each other's stories deeply and profoundly. Now, what has that meant to me? And with this, I conclude. It occurs to me, my friends, that the great ritual mitzvah that now we confront as we enter into the sacred days of the Jewish calendar is to remind you that it is not a mitzvah for a Jew to blow the shofar. It's a nice thing to do. What's the mitzvah? To hear it. Bitzivanu lishmoa kol. I will now suggest to you that it's a mitzvah for us to hear. I will also now make one of the most left-wing comments that you will ever hear me make. <laughs> Do not come to love them too much. I think that peace between Israelis and Palestinians starts small. It starts with relationships. And it starts with hearing each other's painful stories. I end with the following story. 
I have very good friends who live in Carmiel, which is now a large burgeoning city in the Galilee. But when they moved there, shortly after their wedding in 1976, two days after Antebi, it was basically a falafel stand in an apartment building. They tell me the story that I've always remembered, but that they have forgotten. As they were building their dream home in Carmiel, an Arab workman came to them with a torn, tattered set of papers. And he said to them in Arabic, I want you to see these papers. This is the deed to this land written by the Ottomans. My family owns this land. I build your house with my tears. What did you do? And they said, we invited him in. We made coffee. We sat, we drank coffee. We talked about our dreams. And we cried. Is that enough? No. Is it a start? Yes. To feel each other's pain, to feel empathy, even for the person with whom we disagree, is a good start. 